Okay, welcome back to another Coda podcast. I'm very excited to have my friend and uh, colleague and Coda contributor, the incredible Dr. Kate Charlesworth with us today. Well, you are incredible. Stop shaking your head. <laughs> Kate is a medical doctor, but also has a PhD in sustainable health care and is one of the few people I know, maybe the, well, actually the only person I know who has a job in uh, sustainable health care. And Kate, maybe I'm going to actually just start right there before we sort of dive into what you actually do. Are you the only person with a job in sustainable health care? Well, no, excitingly. I was when I was appointed um, a couple of years ago, Roger, was the first first person of a medical background to be appointed to a dedicated sustainability role. But in the last six or 12 months, I've heard about a number of roles that are coming up. And I think this is actually really exciting because they're sort of like hybrid roles. So people have, a, you know, clinical work three or four days a week and then a day or two a week on sustainability things, which I actually think is the, the real model forward. So it's, it's pleasing to see. Yeah. Wow. There's more of so us now. Does that mean we're going to get you back to clinical medicine? Oh, gosh, I haven't seen a patient for, um, for a few years, so I don't think that would be within anyone's best interest. Come on, we all know it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I've got a couple of questions for you. The, fir the first one is, you know, I guess now everyone's talking about net zero. And uh, can you, what, what is net zero, just for, for those of us that don't know? Okay, so net zero is we're not producing pollution we're carbon neutral in a way so I guess for the health system the point to make is that currently we have a very high carbon health system we use dirty fossil fuel based energy to run our hospitals and our facilities we produce we use a lot of stuff we use a lot of single use items we produce vast amounts of waste so it's a very it's a high carbon system and the the blow you know the mind-blowing fact is that globally if the health sector were a country we would be the fifth biggest polluter on the planet okay so we have a, a massive Health sector has a massive carbon footprint. We're very, very high carbon. As you say, we need to get to zero carbon or carbon neutral, um, or even really low carbon, then offset the rest. And that means not producing um, much pollution, if at all, um, and a, a circular economy and all those sorts of things that go with that. Um, I think the really interesting thing is that if you want to know what that, you know, the next question then is, okay, what does that look like? In the NHS, they've actually modelled that. Okay, how would we get to a net zero health system? Because no one's ever been, we haven't even really thought much about this before. No one's ever been there before. But they've actually modelled it. And they found that there's a whole raft of things that you'd need to do across pretty much every area of the health system. Some of it's about en energy and engineering and things, but then also about transport and then about also models of care and how we deliver medicine and telehealth and then specific high clinical, you know, specific areas such as anaesthetic gases and respiratory inhalers and nitrous oxide and things, and then prevention. So there's a whole range of things that we would need to do to make, as you say, like a, a zero carbon health system. Yeah. And, and one of the things uh, on the recent Coda Zero episode that you hosted, I know um, that, uh, that Nick Watts, the, who you know, obviously is driving a lot of that change in the NHS and, and uh, through the Lancet countdown, discussed was also the effect of who we do business with in healthcare, right? Because obviously we're dealing with big um, manufacturing companies, pharmaceutical companies, uh, in and you know the like. Um, can you say yeah. something about that? No, exactly. I mean, firstly, Nick's an Australian. He's a friend and colleague of ours. He's an absolute star, and he's now the NHS's chief sustainability officer. And he's going to have by July this year a team of 150 and massive funding. And importantly, the, the, the support of the senior executive NHS. So they're, you know, they're way ahead there. They're doing some really exciting things. But exactly as you say, I mean, you can't address waste without looking at what you buy in the first place. And the NHS is like, what is it? The, like the, one of the biggest organisations or, you know, buyers in the world. They have huge purchasing power. And they have said, in 10 years' time, we will not do business with anyone, any suppliers, any companies who don't have... Um, uh, net zero emissions that are, are as ambitious or equal to ours and they've got a bit of pushback but they've they're holding you know they're holding the line and they're saying you know this is the way that we want to go and this is this is who we want to do business with so I think that's hugely encouraging yeah that's amazing okay so that's I'm now thinking of you as the uh the next Nick Watts that you're going to be Nick Nick Watts in Australia we just have to make that happen 
or either that or we have to bring Nick home, which is probably a bit difficult with quarantine and everything. It might else, be but... tricky, but it's certainly probably a much more attractive place for him, I would say. Yeah. Anyway, probably. we'll talk to Nick about it. You mentioned um, earlier the word circular economy. Can you just explain to us what that is? Yeah, sure. So basically at the moment we have a linear economy. We, we buy things, we use them, we throw them out. A lot of them are single use, particularly in medicine, but also, you know, your coffee cups and stuff like that. So we buy, use and throw out. And that produces, I mean, a mind-boggling amount of waste. There is a slide that I often show of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, a huge amount of rubbish out in the Pacific Ocean that is three times the size of France. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. And there's, you know, you, there's been more plastic in the ocean um, than fish by 2050. You know, these sort of statistics. So a, a circular economy is just saying we really we need to rethink, rethink the whole situation um, and, and produce things which um, got, undergo a circular process. So they're produced with a view to looking at circularity. They're produced, they might be reused a number of times. Um, and then they might be repurposed into something else. And then the bottom line is, you know, and then perhaps recycled and, and remade. But that sort of systems thinking or circular thinking um, rather than the, the linear model. And there's some, there are some emerging examples of that. I think the, one of the most important things is about producer responsibility. So the companies who are making stuff have to start thinking about the whole life cycle of that product, you know, right through from production, right through to, through to waste at the end. So. Yeah, that's how we need to start. You know, that's a different mindset. Yeah, I love this idea of, of us being able to, you know, really drive industry because of our buying power into, uh, you know, thinking about that. And, and this, you know, I guess the concept that we've always looked at, at the instruments we buy or the, you know, things that, is it fit for purpose? What's the cost? And now we're going to start factoring in and, you know, tell us about the life cycle of that that object to tell us how it fits into the circular economy of the hospital. Yeah, no, I think exactly in that responsibility. I mean, we need to work with suppliers in the first place, but that responsibility needs to go back on to them. You know, we're, and we just put that into the criteria. As you say, we already evaluate, you know, what is it, the instruments that we want? Are they good quality? Is it, does it suit our purpose? What's the financial cost? And the other thing is what's the environmental cost and what, is, what are you doing, you know, that, that is in line with our values as a health system? Yeah. So tell me about, your job um, at the moment as a um, you know sustainability officer what what are you doing yeah so I mean as I see it there are two key tasks ahead of the health system now okay the first one is that as we've talked about we have a massive carbon footprint we have a responsibility to get our own house in order and to reduce that um, so that's about mitigation but the other part of course is that you know even if we stop polluting tomorrow there is climate change locked into the system for decades. And so the health sector will have to be prepared and resilient for those changes. You know, how are we going to manage heat waves? How are we going to make sure our hospitals don't flood? That sort of stuff. So that's adaptation. So they're the two big tasks, mitigation, adaptation. Um, and that's climate, they're, you know, the transition risks and, and physical climate risks, we, we would say. So the task of someone like me, and there's a whole um, I'm probably one of the few from a clinical background, as we've discussed, but there's a range of sustainability leads across you know, the country and across New South Wales Health. Um, our role is to um, address those two risks. So, you know, there's a whole range of projects that come under those two umbrellas. Can you tell me, uh, get us excited though, what, what do you think is the most exciting uh, project that's happening? Because, you know, you mentioned earlier sort of about circular economy and and in that you mentioned like keep cups and things and and we're all way past that now aren't we I think we're all starting to recognize that we've got to do big stuff so yeah. is, is there something you can tease us with that that you've been looking at or okay I mean well keep, yeah I mean keep cups exactly like we're never going to win this <laughs> on the keep cups um like, okay, so in terms of circular economy, there is a lot actually happening in this space. There's gov New South Wales government has set up a circular economy, sort of um, New South Wales Circular, which is tasked with establishing a circular economy in New South Wales. They work in partnership with the UNSW Smart Centre. And you may have seen, you know, their work has been quite public um, in terms of what they're doing. And they're really interested in healthcare. Healthcare has very often very high quality plastics. And actually a lot of it is clean. So they're really interested in that. So there's now several pilot schemes underway um, with teams from different hospitals around Sydney 
whereby healthcare, clean healthcare plastics are being recycled. Um, they're teaming up with the private sector with different companies who will chip those down and then make them into new products. Often they're into um, building products and plumbing type products and so on because they're not, um, they're sort of, I guess there's, you know, standards for stereology and things are lower than ours, but that's, you know, that, that's establishing a circular economy. I mean, in the longer term, it'd be great to know, you know, if we could make like for like, you know, so the health sector's actual own waste went back into remaking things. I think some of the exciting stuff is, about, I mean, PPE, I get asked about PPE all the time because obviously <laughs> it's just been, you know, like a horrifying, I almost can't bear to think about it, the amount of waste that's been produced over the past 12 months. But like taking PPE masks and um, squashing them, rubbing them down into making, putting them into uh, rubble to make roads and things like that, because they actually, there's some engineers, I think, in Melbourne who've worked on that. And they're actually, the, they're just the right amount of springiness in the road, just about the right amount of give. If you get the right proportion of that sort of material, then it's, you know, terrific for roads, apparently. So there's, there's so much potential there, you know, and us working with engineers and with circular economy people and economists, you know, to establish those things. So that's in circular economy. I think, I mean, in, in energy, I mean, I've talked a lot, energy is not the whole story, but it's, you know, bang for your buck, it's probably the first thing, if you could get energy right, that would make a, a big chunk, um, a big dent in our emissions. And we've seen just in the last few weeks, you know, so we need to get all healthcare facilities to go to clean energy. Um, you know, I, um, there's been some significant announcements in Victoria. They're going to be all their hospitals and education facilities will be um, renewables, 100% renewables, I think, by 2025. We just saw last week in South Australia, their new women's and children's hospital will be 100% electric, you know, no gas, electric heat pumps. So you can see that, I mean, it's going to be slow at first, but it's now things are picking up pace and there's just going to be announcement after announcement as the penny drops and as we start to shift. Yeah. 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 No, it feels, feels exciting. So uh, it's a bit of a shout out to Matt Keane, the energy minister in New South Wales. Wake up, Matt. We know you're, we know you're um, keen on the, pardon the pun, uh, on this topic, but uh, he's falling behind, isn't he, Victoria? That's, they're amazing. I, th I mean, I just think there was there's some research that came out of Harvard a few months ago, big study, and it looked at the air pollution from fossil fuels. So they actually looked specifically at the air pollution just from fossil fuels, not other forms of air pollution, not even bushfires, but fossil fuel air pollution is responsible for nearly one in five deaths globally. I mean, yeah. I just find that an extraordinary figure. So we should be going to our CEs, you know, our leaders and saying, look, we don't, you know, fossil fuels are responsible for one in five deaths. You know, we don't, we wouldn't use asbestos in our hospitals. We don't allow people to smoke in our hospitals. Why are we using fossil fuel based energy to, to power our hospitals? You know, this is a, it's, it's an environmental argument. It's a health argument. It's a financial argument when you do the numbers. And it's an ethical argument as well. Like there's a very strong case for us to be using clean energy. Yeah, I think that's a, a really nice analogy with the uh, tobacco companies and asbestos and, you know, as doctors, this is really right in our sector. You know, we, we know that big companies making asbestos and, and the same thing with the tobacco companies have lobbied and dodged and, and uh, you know, smoke screens, again, pardon the pun, but they've used every tactic to try to get out of admitting the fact that, you know, this, this just has to change. And we're still dealing with that incredibly um, in this country. And, and I think it's a great that healthcare really needs to take the lead and say, yeah, one in five people is dying from this, uh, from from this sort of air pollution that comes from fossil fuels alone, mm. as well as some of those staggering other facts that you just dropped into the conversation. You know that that healthcare globally is like the fifth biggest producer of of carbon emissions. That soon there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish. It's just doing my head in. So, Kate, if you were able to give the audience sort of one thing that, uh, you know, that they should be doing at their shop, not just at their home. I know that we all at our homes need to be switching to, to green energy. We've got to try and get solar on our roofs if we can. And, and those things are really clear to me. We need to, in, you know, in, look at our investments and uh, personally and, uh, you know, make sure that we're not investing in fossil fuels through our super funds. And it's good news that a lot of the big movers in that space, particularly Hester, um, mm. aware are coming out saying that they're they're moving to that by 2030. 
But what what thing do you think we should all be starting to sort of get together and, and advocate for in our shops? I don't, do I only get one thing to say? One, to... just one, yeah. Okay, two. Okay, so, I mean, we talked about energy. Like getting a group, of, one, one doctor is not enough. Get a group of you together or a group of a couple of health professionals and go to your GM, your general manager or your CE and make the case as we just talked about for energy, you know, because they can then push up and... Um, influence energy contracts. So that's one thing, clean energy for your hospital health facility. Um, using your voice is really important. I mean, we see on the, you know, the social research institutes rank the most to the least trusted professional groups in society and health professionals are always at the top. You know, we are the most trusted and respected professional groups and we are really well respected not you know, in our communities, in the media and other things. So speaking up, you know, climate change is a health issue. And then I'm sneaking in here. So, um, and just do something. I mean, we have, whatever it is in your area, we have you know, nurses on our maternity wards who got together and who, fund, who got you know, a grant for a dishwasher. So they're using quality reusable glass bottles because they couldn't bear to see all the single use plastic baby bottles that we used every day. So they're doing that. We've got staff in our EDs who are, pushing the Baxter PVC recycling scheme. So, you know, they're looking at that. We've got, you know, public health units who are like greening the hospital spaces and tree planting. There's, you've just got to do something. And it's, it's, all, it's all part of, you know, it's all part of the solution. And then share up and scale your wins, you know. So share them with us because we really just do need all hands on deck. But do something, get up tomorrow and do something. Get up the next day, do something else. You know, the next day you have a busy day, let that go. But then the next day you do two things. You know, it just really requires people to get cracking. Kate, um, it's always lovely talking to you. You're amazing. And um, I'm going to get you back to chat soon about some more ideas in this space. Don't uh, forget everybody at home that CODA is still happening. COVID's been mucking us all around. Well, more than mucking us around. So many of our friends around the world have been really suffering with COVID. And, um, but we're pushing on. We've got plans for Melbourne next year, Melbourne 3 to 6th of April. So we're all really excited about that. And we're putting a lot of pressures on our own partners too, not just through the hospital, but CODA itself is working with a lot of our big partners, particularly like Teleflex, to, to say, what can we do in the device space about renewables so we are doing our our bit there and and the good news is, is that they're responding so that's really excited kate thank you for for being here look forward to talking soon and we just got to work out you know how we can clone you and um and you know have everyone have a sustainability officer which is what we need mm. you're most welcome delighted to be here thanks Russia. talk soon bye bye